Welcome to another edition of Talkback Fans. I'm Pat Linden. I'm Danny Boyce, Terry Isle. <laughs> John <Josh Siglio. laughs> And Alex Isle. We're trying a new thing with Danny today. It's called uh, No Mic. Off headsets. <laughs> And uh, we are back at Lino's tonight for uh, for a very special guest. Who we got with us tonight, Ter? Uh, tonight we have a modified version of a high school football preview show. We are joined by St. Edward's head coach, Tom Lombardo. Coach, thanks for joining us. How are you tonight? I'm doing fine. Nice to be here. Thanks, thanks for being here. We greatly appreciate it, Coach. Um, had to make some modifications uh, due to what I've nicely referred to as the distractions that have been created by COVID. Um, but we greatly appreciate it. Coach, you guys are, the Eagles are coming off of an 11-2 and two season, bowed out in a overtime loss in the regional finals last year. Um, coach, as you kind of look at where you guys are at here, you've had a little bit more than a week of practice. How do you feel about where your guys are at? You know, we feel pretty good. It's, 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 it's kind of surreal. Uh, um, the hard part is, you know, you're kind of, in some ways, you're practicing without a purpose. Um, until there's definitive, you know, answer that, yes, you know, we're playing. The OHSA proposal, I think, is wonderful. I've been a proponent of shortening the season and playing in the fall because I think that's our best shot, to be honest. Uh, letting everyone in the playoffs so teams that get impacted by the virus aren't affected by computer points. Uh, and I think, you know, for when kids go back to school and if, and, and if they decide to get tested, I think it's probably a matter of when, not if. Uh, there's just so many kids on a team that it, it would be hard. You don't have them in a bubble. So if you have to stop two weeks, as long as it's not week six, you know, you could play in the playoffs even with four games or three games and have a chance to compete. However, until we get the okay, it was hard to plan, you know. So we've shortened practices. We're only uh, the first week we were only on the field two hours. Um, we delayed putting full pads on until this Monday. Um and uh, but in some ways we had more practice time in in June because the state allowed that they uh, it, uh, they uh, rescinded the 10 day practice thing and let you go every day uh, in phases so uh, we got as much work done in the summer as we would have in the past we were in a good spot we're still in a good spot our, our, we're fresh uh, we have good numbers we have about 130 130 ish players 10 through 12 and uh, practice is going well you know it's uh, when you're when you're within the lines. You don't, you don't kind of realize it. It's when it's all the before. You know, the kids come with masks and they get the temperature taken. They got to wash their hands. They got to bring their own water bottles. Uh, we don't use locker rooms. Uh, we social distance kind of when you're not in. But when you're playing and running the plays and doing seven-on-seven -seven drills and team drills, it's kind of business as usual, to be honest. So that's that's the part that's kind of strange. You know, you're you're practicing as if everything's pretty normal, yet in the back of your mind, you know, we may not even play. Yeah. No, no. I was going to say, normally when when you have a regular season, which this is not going to be, it's going to be irregular no matter how you look at it, how have you um, kind of had to work through not only what you're going to do on the field, but like the parents' concerns and the, and the school's concerns and things like that? Following the protocols, you know, the, our parents have been great so far. Um, they're, they're for the kids, obviously doing something, you know, um, uh, I'm also a parent. My son just graduated from St. Ed's. Uh, he was a receiver last year and played baseball. And his spring baseball season, we had a great baseball team, I thought, at St. Ed's, and it got canceled. And the reason the OHSA said, well, if you're not in school, you know, you, you shouldn't play sports. Yet, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd say mid to late April, that was canceled officially. And May 26th, they opened it up, and he played 25 games in the summer uh, for baseball uh, and without incident. And that was from, you know, kids as, as young as six or five all the way to 18 or 20, whatever they were. So, you know, now I think they're seeing, well, <clears throat> what do you do if you remote learn? Uh, you know, are you should you play sports? You know, the, the ODH says one thing, the Cuyahoga, certain counties say another thing, and there, it leads to some confusion. So some teams stop practicing for a little bit, then start it up again based on taking one recommendation over another. Some have uh, gone remote learning and said, well, if you're not in school, uh, you, you, you shouldn't play extracurriculars. Which makes some sense, uh, you know. If I'm, if you're a superintendent, uh, that's logical as well. It's hard to say, geez, you can't sit in a math class, but you could go tackle each other at three o'clock if you want, you know. Yeah. So, everyone doesn't really know, and uh, there there hasn't been much guidance until late from the OHSA, in my opinion. And now that they came out with this, at least it gives us a roadmap as we create a schedule, 
I listened to the governor's briefing today, and it kind of sounds like he wants to play or give it a shot at least. But who knows what it's going to look like? Yeah. Will there be fans? Uh, what's the game actually going to look like? Uh, how do you get to games? You know, in terms of busing, how do you, you know, what, what, what's it going to look like? No one really knows that. But if the kids get a chance to play and compete, and there's some semblance of a tournament, I think that's the best we could do. And given the hand we're dealt. Do you feel that there's been a lack of leadership in Columbus, whether it be from the governor's office, the OHSAA, the Ohio Department of Health, and a lot of, you even said it, a lot of conflicting opinions from the county boards of health as compared to what the state's done? I've asked other coaches that too. I just feel it's necessary to get your opinion. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go so far as saying lack of leadership. I, I think it's just lack of really knowing what to do. There, there really is no answer if you're in that position. Uh, I, I would have liked to see the OHSA done this earlier. Because I think the writing was on the wall. To keep saying, like, well, it's up to the school district and we're going to play 12, 10 games and have a playoff. I, you know, the, the regular flu star, I doubt you were going to play the December. We may not even make it through this, but at least this gives us a chance. And it gives teams outs if they don't want to be in the playoffs, if they get hit with, uh, you know, some cases and they have to suspend a couple weeks. Uh, they can make up games, uh, even though not competing, but they could get six, seven games. So the kids that are college prospects can get some film. And it's not a total loss. It's not the same, but it's not a total loss then. So, you know, le- lack of leadership, lack of guidance, lack of foresight, uh, or just lack of knowledge, I think, is the most thing I would say that, you know, th- just we didn't have it and no one really knew what to do. Now you're seeing, you know, so you kind of got the college conferences canceling the Big Ten and the Pac-12, the MAC obviously was first, now the Mount Wet, you know, and okay, well, the Big Ten's not going to play, the OEC's not going to play, the MAC's not going to play. All the Ohio schools basically aren't playing. Cincinnati, I guess, still is the only one right now. And Notre Dame College, because uh, they're, they're only delayed till October. Is that all? Yeah. Okay, so two schools in Ohio that we're aware of, and uh, the high school's going to go play. You know, So that that's kind of, if you if you have the pro and con sheet for playing high school sports and not playing, you got, well, colleges are all canceling. That's the negative if you look at it that way. But, you know, the mental health a- aspect and the kids have been working hard, so... And I was on Channel 19 yesterday, and it was like, I hope all the stuff we weren't doing since June 3rd when we started was just for exercise, you know. <laughs> uh, if, if that was the plan all along and they let us go out there and, and, and install and practice like we're doing it, and then all of a sudden we're not even going to play a game, you know, I you know, I feel bad for the kids. If I was a parent, I would even feel worse. If I was the kid, I'd feel be worse, you know. So from a school perspective, are, are, are they having in-person classes at St. Ed's? Yes. Okay. Uh, Next question, you talked about your son, and they played over the summer, and we've had this discussion amongst ourselves because we know a lot of guys who are involved in travel baseball and travel softball. And the way that you know that there wasn't some major outbreak is because we never heard about it, right? Right. There were some issues here, issues there, a a couple of one-offs, but it seemed as if there there were no major outbreaks or or situations with travel. Um, I fully understand that football is a completely different level of contact than baseball is. But are there some protocols that they that took place in baseball that you guys have been able to apply to football to try to stay within the guidelines? It's a great question, Terry. You know, I, I, the sports are different, obviously, and the kids weren't in school. Well, with football, they're going to go back to school if you're going to in-person classes and intermingling with other communities that are kind of in the same area as you, let's say the same county or neighboring counties for mm-hmm. the most part. Uh, uh, where baseball, you kind of... You know, and I, I didn't see much difference. I mean, the kids were in the dugout. They didn't shake hands after the game, and maybe they used their same balls. But uh, other than that, it was kind of like, you know, there wasn't a, too many fans wearing masks, you know, during the game, and yet you didn't hear about it. The kids going back to school, is that going to make a difference? I don't know. And the nature of football is against social distancing. So I, I, I laugh at the irony of, well, we're going to say one person could be out there for the coin flip, and you got to stand six, far to pee, uh, six feet apart on the sidelines. Yet... The whole game you could gang tackle, and, you know, there's going to be a zero technique over a center breathing on each other for more than 50 minutes. You know, it just it's like I, I highly doubt where you stand on the sideline is what's going to cause the virus. It's going to be playing the game itself. So, you know, we're going to do all these other things for optics, in my opinion, and sort of like we're going to let the game go. So it's like, yeah, maybe not condensing them and stuffing them in a the locker room makes some sense. Probably bringing your own water bottles. I think those are the two biggest things that we've done that most schools are doing mm-hmm. that probably has not spread it. But you can't prohibit it when you're doing an inside run drill or you're doing a one-on-one blocking drill. I mean, you know, you played on the old line. I mean, it's just 
you know, if, if you're going to get it, that's where you, if someone has it, you're gonna, probably going to pass it on at that mm-hmm. drill. Mm-hmm. Probably not standing on the sidelines. You, yeah. t- you talked about, you know, the uncertainty, and you kind of mentioned we're kind of preparing for nothing right now, I believe is what you said, because we don't have – we're two weeks away, and we still don't have state approval to actually play football games. What have you been telling your guys to kind of keep them focused and motivated when who knows if any of this is going to be – work? you know, actually have a result? Yeah, that's the, it's tough. It's the hope of that, you know, we're doing it and they're doing something they love. And I, I don't want to say we're not preparing for nothing. So we don't have scrimmages. Uh, we still don't – you know, we're, we're just getting a first game. So we don't even know who to prepare for. Yeah. And you're not going to have much – you know, you, obviously you're not going to see the opponent. And, and the way I look at this is – these six games are glorified scrimmages. I mean, it doesn't really matter. if You, you want to win them, of course. But if you don't, in the old system, it's like, whoa. When we started 0-2 in 2018, and we lost a matter by a, uh, by a point and lost a cast uh, by a Hail Mary, we're 0-2, and I'm going, man, we may not make the playoffs. Uh, well, now if we go 0-2, I, we're talking about maybe opening with Maslin and then playing Oban. We very well could be. We could win them. We could lose one. We could win it. But if, you know, if we lose both 24 to 21, Okay, you know, our goal is to be the best team by week seven, and if we lose week one or two, it's not it, it doesn't it's not the end of the world. So you could still compete and win first day uh, as you get better and play first day championship if you're a good team. So you know, right now, uh, if we verify, we're talking about maybe Maslin week one. We got to you know, Holbin looks like it's two. Menor, if if they can do it, is week three. But if their lead comes back, we may lose that game. We're hoping Ignatius could play week four again. It's it's we don't know for sure. We're hoping. We don't have five yet, and uh, Benedict in week six. So yeah. uh, I, that's about who's who. You can. I don't know if you can get any tougher than that. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know. I like the I like the answer you gave to the the six game situations because one of the oh. questions that I've asked other coaches is is especially if you have a young team, right? Um, you're coming into this season. Normally, that first those three scrimmages are huge because you get a chance to figure out who's who, and you also don't have to worry about the issue of okay guys are so jacked up to hit somebody else that they go into week one too high, so to yeah, speak. Right. Um, so I, I like the fact that you say, well, to a certain extent, you can look at those first as the, the six regular season games as scrimmages because there's not a lot of difference between, yes, you'd love to be six and oh, but if you're four and two or two and four, but if you learned a lot, that's right. Right. That's almost better than having the full three scrimmages and then playing a normal 10 game season. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, they're games, so they're 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 more relevant than the scrimmages, but they're kind of going to be run like, where you know, you're kind of going to prepare like scrimmages because you're not going to really have a lot of film on anyone, uh, you know, where you have the scrimmages and then you have a game or two. You know, by week three you'll get a couple games and be able to trade that. And uh, frankly, like you said, you may not know your team very well. I mean, on both sides, you know, mm-hmm. like there may be play. We have a lot of players. I mean, yeah. we think these guys might be the best players, but they may not be, and we may not know that until uh, the season progresses a little bit more. So. You know, you could you could you could see something totally different week seven, and I could very easily see a, a team that plays a brutal schedule. And by the way, there should be incentive to play a tough schedule. You know, like like if we can't get games now, we're never going to get games. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> when, when, when it doesn't matter, you know, like yeah. I, that's what I'm trying to say. It's kind of like, well, if you think you have a decent team or you want to compete, well, now's the time to give it a chance because, you know, if you don't win the game, it doesn't hurt you for making the playoffs. So you just kind of find where, where you're at and. I think a lot of teams would surprise themselves if they took the chance and say, geez, well, we, you know, we, 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 we could play with St. Ed's. Which um, is what I've been calling for quite the last few years. So there's a couple of, like, real, like, make absolutely perfect sense to play, but they never play kind of situation. And you're, and you're right. You might you might actually see that, you know, in one of these six weeks. Now, the, the, pro- the problem is that teams, that the leagues all agree to play, you know, if it's a seven-team mm-hmm. league and they're going to play their six-league games because that's easy and right. the proximity is right night. You know, I get that. But – for teams that either aren't in a league or somehow their league's not playing or some are and some aren't and they're just looking for games, you know, I I, I, I would, if I was in the other boat, I'd say, but this is the year to try and do that or challenge yourself. And, you know, coaches are pretty good with each other. You know, if you could see the games getting out of hand, it, 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 at this, you know, I'd like to play as many guys as I could anyways to, to, to get it. So, you know, if, if, if we're way advanced, uh, you know, and, and we jump out to a big lead or something like that on maybe a, a, a lesser opponent, but you may not. But if you do, it's like, all right, I'm not, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's like it doesn't matter what the final score is. It doesn't even really matter if the, you win in the final score. You know, it's just can you get your team better through the six weeks? So when it really counts, if there's going to be a tournament, yeah. you have a chance to win a state title, which is our goal. So uh, you could win it a two and four, I think. If you play a tough schedule and lose four close games, win two close ones, 
and all of a sudden you're playoff ready, you know, versus you play six teams that kind of, you know, aren't so great and you kind of win them all, but you, you bow out in the, you know, first or second round because you, you weren't really challenged. Coach, in the past, in a normal week, how many guys would you travel? And do you think that'll change this year because yeah. of the social distancing requirements? That, well, I think it's you know, 20 kids to a bus or something like that. Will will that yeah. limit your ability to travel as many guys as maybe you would have in the past? Yes, and, and that, that's a great thing that we're discussing. So if we play at Lakewood, we may walk, you know, so take as many as we can. <laughs> There's a great way to warm up, and I'm not even, I, I don't even want to worry about a bus. Okay, you know? fair, so, fair yeah. enough. Uh, <laughs> and then... If we play in a road game, we're talking about letting the parents take the kids, you know, so uh, we don't have to get them on a bus. Because I, I okay. don't uh, – my biggest fear is I, I don't want a kid to practice and bust his ass all week long and then dress 40 kids and say, you know, son, you're a senior. You don't get to dress for this game. That is, that, to me, that would break my heart. I couldn't do it. So if it means not going on a bus, we'll just have everyone meet at the stadium and, yeah. you know, hey, be there at 5 o'clock and, you know, have our pregame walk through. Everyone get there at 5 o'clock. And what's the difference? Coach, you know? I wanted to go back to something that you were just talking about from, from teams stepping up and maybe have an opportunity to maybe, you know, play in, in, in conditions that normally you wouldn't see. Is it also uh, advantageous from a coaching staff perspective that you might be able to get some guys some time in, in real games that they probably wouldn't see week one, week two, week three in a regular season? Absolutely. And you, and you could play multiple guys now. Like I said, if you see it from the perspective that because you're in the playoffs, you know, that these games, the, the, you know, I, I guess for my personal record or for the school's record, you know, you don't want to go and say that was one and five or two and four. But, you know, you, like I said, I'm not saying you don't want to win the games. What I'm saying is you have a chance to develop your teams in other ways that get you ready for week seven uh, that might that you normally might not do uh, when there was computer points on the line. Now that there's not computer points on the line, you know, you. You want to make the team the best you can make it by week seven. That may mean, you know, uh, alternating some guys just to see who's the better guy. And it, it might come back to bite you a little bit, but it, it might be worth doing to make sure you know that this guy can't play in this situation or can. I don't know how many of these situations would arise. We'll have to see this as we continue practicing. And But there's some guys competing for some spots that you could tell uh, are pretty even. And uh, in a normal game, you'd kind of pick one and say, you know, let's see. You might rotate too, but you, you're, you have more uh, impetus, more motivation to – uh, to play more guys and um, you know if you get a couple touchdown lead maybe uh, or get behind you know by whatever you might have an impetus to to play because you know the kids will be sad if they lose but they know what the main goal is uh, you know along this way it's interesting Indiana has no uh, has, everyone makes the playoffs and their coach at um, Cathedral uh, we've played them a couple times and they've won the state title going four and five in the regular season because mm-hmm. they played a who's who they played you know Xavier and Cincinnati and you know, all these great teams. And he's like, I don't, you know, I, we just want to be the best team by the time week 10 comes around and we start the playoffs. It does, our record doesn't matter. So they were 4-5 and five in the regular season and then 10-5 and five or 9-5 and five state champs. So I, I could see that happening here. It, there's some teams that don't even have to play and can go into the playoffs. Yeah. So, you know? yeah, so, Coach, you know, your place, it, typically it's been a tough place for a sophomore to get on the field. Yet it seems like every year you guys have a couple of guys who find a way to start as sophomores and end up having great careers. Does this, from that standpoint, then maybe give you that opportunity, hey, yeah, we get up three scores, hey, there's a group of sophomores who, in a normal situation, there's, they're really not going to see the field, but now under these circumstances, hey, we can. So this actually, the unintended benefit is, hey, we get a better look at these guys in Friday and Saturday night conditions than we would in a normal season. Yeah, I think you hit it right on that. I think that's that's fair, and not only for sophomores, but like I said, for any type of guys that are in close competition, you're not as, you know, I don't want to say worried, but uh, it, it, the stakes aren't as high when it's the computer points. I know how I felt when Cass Tech caught that Hail Mary, knowing we're 0-2, and seeing the hurdle you have to climb to make the playoffs. And we we were state champs and had to score a touchdown late to beat Moeller at Moeller to qualify for the playoffs. And we ended up, you know, winning the state championship. Mm-hmm. So that's how close it could be. We, we don't win that game. I don't think we qualify. So, uh, you know, I, I, which is why uh, on a separate separate topic, I'm a believer in expanding the playoffs and or letting everyone in. It's impossible in Ohio to let everyone in and still play 10 regular season games. But you could double. My suggestion is you have a nine-week season, and week 10 is a regional play-in game. Uh, one plays 16 in the region, two plays 15. Basically what they're doing with 12, but just add it to 16. And the winners are the eight playoff teams, and then everything's the same from there. 
uh, the, 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 the Harvard points then just get you into that play-in game. Then you have to win a game to get in, which essentially is like having 16 teams in. But, but uh, I think what it does, it opens up scheduling. You're not worried about a, you know, the 8-9 sometimes comes down between a, you know, there's a Senate game that one team played that if, you know, if, if, if Collinwood wins, Team A goes. If Collinwood loses, Team B goes, you know. Mm-hmm. And why should that, why should it be based on a tenth of a computer point on a, on a, on a, on a game uh, that someone else that you beat earlier in the year is playing if they win or lose to determine who makes the playoffs? Let that game be played on the field. Eight and nine, that'd be a heck of a game. Who wins? They're the playoff team. So I, I think well, maybe even some unintended benefits out of this would be, this is pretty cool. You know, like there, you'll see some matchups maybe. Uh, teams hopefully maybe more willing to play and, and, and give it a try. Everybody's got, you know, everyone knows they're in if they want to be in. And uh, y- y- you make a run that way. Because I, you know, I, I get the argument that 16 teams don't deserve to be in the playoffs because they're probably not good enough. However, every other sport, every team gets to compete. Every sport. If you want to compete in the postseason, no matter what your record is, you get a chance, except football. And I, I just feel like um, it, it, I, it, the scheduling is hard that way because you're trying to schedule just to make computer points uh, to qualify as the top eight, not really challenge your team or anything else. You want to get those independent wins that accrue points, that teams beat other teams, or that you, you know, kind of you know you are favored and uh, you know this team is going to win five or six games. P- perfect schedule. You know, that's, that, that's who everyone's looking to find. Well, that doesn't leave, uh, you know, uh, that doesn't make it very motivation for a, a, a lesser division team to maybe challenge and play a higher division team or just to even, you know, division one power say, let's go because it doesn't matter. You know, let's, let's, let's let the game play. And, and so in your mind, coach, is that the trade off is shorten the regular season by a week, maybe two in order to expand the playoffs? That, that, that was my suggestion to the OHSA. Okay. And, and they went for expansion. I'm for expansion. I, the, the system they have with 12 teams, though, uh, I, Bo Rugg had texted a few of us coaches and asked our opinion on it. And uh, I wrote back, uh, and I said, has anyone ever had a bye week? You know, we've had multiple bye weeks. We, we don't play very well off a of bye week. It's very difficult for high school kids mm-hmm. uh, to, to play. You know, everyone thinks, like, oh, great, you can rest up, you can do this, but you get out of rhythm, you lose focus. It, 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 well, kids are uh, creatures of habit. And uh, I'll tell you, I don't know if I want to be a four seed in this new system. You know, you're sitting, you're probably pretty close to the five seed. They're playing a playoff uh, uh, intensity level game against 12. If they win with that week of preparation, you're sitting there, you're going to see a lot of fives beat those fours, in my opinion, and even threes. Uh, it, it's, it, it's difficult. You might see some ones go down mm-hmm. uh, because of that. So based on that, with the, with the proposed schedule for this year, so let's say you guys go 5-1, and 6-0, and, oh, and you get a bye, yeah. okay? But you're allowed to schedule a regular season game in week seven. Would you do that? Yeah, that, that, I think I would. If I could do it and find a team, I, yeah. Play a lot of people. Like, you know, if, if it didn't mean much. Um, that's a good question. I didn't know. Like, I guess I would have to see how many teams actually opt in and then if there's a bye week right. or not, how they can match up. But I never thought of that. That's, a, that's an interesting perspective. So your other, the other point you brought up earlier, so you said you watched the governor today. Yeah. And then did you watch him take questions then afterwards? Yeah. And so then when he was asked the question that, that the Big Ten canceled, did you see his face? Yeah. Do you think that it's going to have any effect on his decision? Well, he kept saying, uh, you don't make decisions in a vacuum. He, he said must it three that, times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what that means. You know? I, I, I tend to think that the Big Ten's decision is going to help Ohio high school football be played this fall. Mm-hmm. Because if we know anything about what's going on, the political climate is, is such extreme that any decision that you make is going to be have ramifications. Sure. And I think... He, he might be the only sitting governor in the history that will have college football and high school football in the state of Ohio canceled within a week of each other. And I don't think he wants to be that guy. I really don't. Now, he, his hands may be tied at some point yep. from the medical experts, but I think it actually helps in, in that regard. I thought reading between the lines that he was giving arguments to play, you know, yes. the mental health yes, of the kids sure. and uh, – with the decision not in a vacuum, that there's many other uh, criteria you have to look at outside of just the effects of COVID, you know. But but at the same time, all these colleges are canceling. And I was asked yesterday too. It was like, well, what's the difference? Well, colleges are on a college campus. Kids from all over, 50,000 kids at Ohio State. They're traveling to other places. Even if it's Illinois or Michigan, it's still out of state. I mean, you're still where you know in Ohio, you're playing St. Ed's and St. Ignatius are playing. The kids are pretty close to each other. You know, uh, uh, you know. Lake Catholic is playing Notre Dame Cathedral Latin. They're not 
they're not coming from all, all over the place. So it, it, you're just contained a little bit better in high school. Uh, and I think with this six-game thing, you know, for example, we were supposed to play Elder, and I said, I don't want to. There's no reason to go to Elder now. I mean, the contracts were voided. I love playing Elder, but why go on a bus for four hours with Mass and sit there? Like, we'll, we'll just mm-hmm. find six local games or th- do something else, you know? I mean, so I, it, that that's probably what's going to happen. Yeah, so, so two things with that, Coach. I've taken the tact along the, the, since this thing started that it would be easier to contain high school football than it would be to contain college football. And I'm, I'm going to use the example just of the two guys that, that he would be associated with. Alex's ar- argument to me was, well, Luke Fickle has a better chance to, and I'll use the term ring fence, his guys, mm-hmm. than, let's say, Jared Good or you do. Yep. And, and I agree that that's probably the truth. But I think there's two key differences. So let's say that he's still there and they go to Memphis this year, okay, which they don't. They went there last year. I can tell him all I want, dude, don't go to Beale Street the night before the game, right? Right? Don't go to Beale Street. But at the end of the day, he's an adult, so he's going to make a decision. Whereas for you or Jared, you still have the parents involved, right? Right. Now, kids have snuck out of houses before, right? It's happened, no matter how much we tried to make sure that it didn't. What are you looking at me for? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but you also have the parents on your side to try to help make sure that Johnny stays in the house the night before the game, right? Right, right? I think that's a huge advantage. And the state of Ohio can sit here and say, all right, well, hey, teams from Canada, teams from Pennsylvania, you're not coming in. Teams from Ohio, I know you had a team from Canada or a team from Pennsylvania or a team from Indiana on your schedule. You're not leaving. Whereas it's a lot harder in the American, well, you got teams in Texas and you got teams in, in – um, Florida. Florida and Carolinas and all these other places, yep. it's a lot easier for that schedule to get disrupted than it is for the schedule in the state of Ohio. Yeah, and, and I think to Alex's point, like it's the testing that's a difference. Like if you could test rapid test your team, of course, how accurate? Look at Dwayne. I mean, he was, you know, that whole story. But so you, if if you have them all negative and they're contained and you could keep them in the dorm and hotel and they don't sneak out, I guess. Alex's point is right. However, is that doable? And can you afford? Can you can you really test like the NFL and the NBA is testing? You know, the NBA is working. I mean, they might as well be in jail. You know, like, I mean, they're in a hotel there. Right. Uh, right. I mean, they're getting tested, so they know. So they know no one has it. They've Disney's been quarantined. Disney's a pretty nice jail to be in. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it's a nice jail, but you know, they're not allowed to and go anywhere Olympics without into permission. Jails before, so, right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I think that's and if college football can make that model and assure that no one was going anywhere. Uh, it, it would it could work, but is that possible? You know, with all, all those kids on your team and all the staff and everything else, uh, where high school, look, I'm not naive enough to think that with this asymptomatic stuff, we could have because we're not testing, we could have three kids at practice today that had it, but no one knows. Mm-hmm. The kids feel fine. Why would they go get tested if they don't? If they're not bothered, and uh, they may have it. But if that's the case, you'd have to assume that's the case. You know, if the, whatever the percentage is, we have 130 players. Let's say two, three. That's a small percentage, but it's not. It doesn't seem to be running rampant. But if we had mandatory testing and we're able to do it quickly and tested everybody every day, and you and your criteria was if you have it, you can't play. My guess is we wouldn't play because I'm, I'm guessing most teams have a guy that has it. Right. Because you may not know it. <laughs> you know, like uh, if they're asymptomatic, why would you go get tested? Like that's what I mean. I don't even know how you have it if you're asymptomatic. It's like well, you have it but you really don't feel it, you know, like uh, you have a broken arm, but you know what, you don't feel anything. So it's not, you know, is it really broken? I mean, you know. Well, and that, that to me is the biggest thing too with the, with the, why the NBA and the MLB and the NFL are, are trying to make it work. And, and I think the NFL will at least attempt to kick off is they're professionals. So there's a business, it's their craft, right? They want to play, right? They want to do what they're good at. They have a union right, who they fought for all of these different testing protocols and everything that's out there, that's how they're able to try to make it work. Now, whether or not they'll all get to the end, I think the NBA and the NHL have the best chance, right, because they're able to bubble. Um, Major League Baseball, you want to believe that these guys are getting the message, and then you have what happened with the Indians pitchers over the weekend, so you're not quite so sure. College, the cost aspect of it, and, and, the, and the geography, I think, becomes a bigger issue. Mm-hmm. Um, on the high school side, it, it's really prohibitive to test as much as you would want to from a cost basis. Yeah, I couldn't do it. Right? So I, I think we're in a position where we have to kind of learn to coexist with the disease. 
Now, again, I, I know that it's not – I know that this is not the flu, right? I'm not like my white ring, right wing buddies who say that this will be, disappear November 5th. Mm-hmm. I'm not like my left wing buddies who think this is a death sentence for everybody. There's a certain subset of the population that this is really, really difficult for, and there's a certain subset of the population that this is – it's not a not event, but it's much, much less. And then there's what it is for the rest of us. Mm-hmm. So we better learn to deal with it and, and try to move on with it and try to normalize or we're all going to be in trouble. I, man, you said just what I think. I'm, 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 I'm the same way. And I think one of the things with college I heard is the, the, the they don't know the long term effects. Now, this heart thing that how does it affect the heart? My I forget what the word is, but um the enlargement of the heart that may come after you get this thing for young kids. Right. Okay, maybe it's not, maybe there isn't anything like that, but we don't know that yet. So if there's some evidence to think that, you know, I don't think any university president or superintendent or anyone running a league wants to, you know, say, geez, if, if that becomes rampant later in life, you know, we played when we didn't have to. You know, but at the same time, the kids want to do it. You know, the parents want to do it. And it's, it is a free, you know, you're, you're taking the shot. Um, you know, what's right and wrong? I, I you know, you don't you don't know whose whose call is it? Um, is it the kids' call? The parents' call? Uh, is it the school's call? You know, so Nebraska says they they're going to go play anyway. The Big Ten says we're not you can't play, and they like, okay, fine, we'll go play. We don't we, we want to do it, and we think we're fine, and we can handle it. Could that happen in high school if the OHSA says you can't play? You know, could the private schools just get together and say we're going to play anyways? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's been one of the other things that I've said that I could see a scenario where you ended up with the private schools, you know, playing somewhat of a modified schedule if enough of the public schools tapped out because of whatever the governor, the the right. uh, county director of health or the board of health or, or whatever the case may be, where you could end up with a scenario. It's not an ideal scenario by any means. No, and, and you don't know with insurance and would it be, you know, and, and how would that play out and look. But it's, it's you know, I think for private schools, where we're at, I think Benedict and I think Sandy, you know, the, you want the kids to go. Like, if you, if you go to remote learning, then what's the benefit of the private school? If you don't have sports yeah. and you go to remote learning, everything that you, you're kind of paying for is, is a lot of it's taken away by when you're at home, you know. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're paying for the, you're paying for the, you know, school is school. I think there's a, Algebra 2 is Algebra 2 in a lot of schools. You know, but St. Ed's has a little twing with that's a little different than what Benedictine has that people say, this is worth right. X number of dollars. Your engineering program, to, your interna- international yeah, baccalaureate service, program, right. Being sure. a Catholic institution, whatever, whatever you want to call it, that some people feel strongly enough to say, yeah. you know, that's worth it. That's outside of just, you know, the, the education, the, uh, the classes itself. Mm-hmm. So it's in our best interest to give the kids all the offerings we can give them while doing it safely and allowing them to attend, attend in person. Yeah. Uh, if that gets taken away, it, it, the differentiation between a lot of schools starts blurring, mm-hmm. and then there's a cost factor to it that, you know, is it worth $17,000, $16,000 to pay if you're learning through a, a Zoom class? Right. You know, so. Well, I want to ask you a football question since we've been talking about COVID sure. for the past half hour. <laughs> um as Terry said, you guys bowed out in one of the best ball games of, of 2019 last year. We got to talk about this. Let's no, go no, back no. to COVID. I, that, that, <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to talk about is not the game, Coach, as much as um, you, you you had some really good senior leadership last year that, that you graduated. Talk about some of the guys that, you, that you're hoping will step up this year and, and, and fill those voids. Yeah, you know, you hate to go back to last, but last year's team was special. One, you know, my son was on the team, and that, that class was really special. And we had 44 seniors. All were wonderful kids. Um, you know, the Jeff Petrowski's of the world that was, was going to Michigan State, and Montori Foster comes out as a senior, and he moves on. Our quarterback, Connor O'Malley, and the receiving core, Brian Kilbane's going to Bowling Green. I mean, I, you know, Ronan Chambers at Akron. We, you know, we had, we really, Joey Farmani at running back, had a wonderful year. I mean, so many others. I'm not, I'm, I couldn't go through 44 guys. And uh, I really, really thought, you know, that we were, you know, we kind of had ran through two playoff games and won them rather easily and we're playing so well. And kudos to Menor, you know, we put, we jump up on them. We're going in for 21 to nothing and get stripped, you know, on the ball. 90, and then they go on 99 yard drive, you know, but 21 nothing, that's hard to come back from, you know. So yeah, and we were dominating there through about a quarter and a half, you know. Um, so that's still, you know, <laughs> we, we, we could talk about the details of that and uh, forever, but. Uh, in terms of this year, you know, we did have some guys with experience that were certainly younger than, than we've been. And when I say younger, I mean more inexperienced. 
we'll, we'll start we'll start a junior quarterback this year, which I have not started a junior quarterback in my tenure of five years. Garrett Zero played some as a junior. He rotated as a starter. We played two. We had a two quarterback system in mm-hmm. 17, uh, but a true junior starter has not happened. So he's very talented, Christian Ramos. Uh, he's going to be awesome, but he's you know he's wet behind the ears. He came in a little bit in that playoff game, correct? Didn't he? He he, he did not in that game, but he played some in the season. Okay. Uh, O'Malley kind of got banged up, and we were looking to, to but then he ran back in. Gotcha. Okay. At some point, um, uh, we got a couple guys back on the line. Uh, on the offensive line, we lose all our receivers. Uh, defensively is where we have some guys back. Uh, our linebackers are strong. We got a couple D, uh, D linemen back. And uh, we got some real youth in the secondary that I think can be good. But again, inexperience, how's that going to play out early? Which So this system for us this year is perfect. We're, you know, we'll play anywhere, anytime, anywhere. You know, so we're going to play the toughest teams. And, uh, you know, we may not win them. But again, I think our kids will learn, get experience. You mentioned the wide receivers. The, the wide receiver talent that you guys have turned out in the last five, six years is mind-boggling. Mm-hmm. How did you guys become the destination, so to speak, for the really good wide receivers in a greater Cleveland area? How did that happen? I, I, I don't know. People people get on me all the time that we don't even throw the ball enough. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I... Uh, I mean, yet, again, you, you, you brought up Montori. So Montori comes out for football. Hadn't played since, what, the fifth or sixth grade, if I remember the story correct? Yeah, I think Gets a ride to Michigan State. You had a wide receiver drafted in the first five rounds of the yeah. MLB draft. Right. <laughs> yeah, if I, it's, it's, you know, it's been lucky. I, I think it just goes to show, you know, the value of why they enjoy football. And maybe some of our coaching staff does really, that it's a, you know, family. And these guys, you would think, you know, there'd be headaches that they want the ball. And like, I'm, I, they were tremendous. You know, no one cared. You know, McKenzie didn't even play the first seven games. He was injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was worried about the baseball. But do you imagine he gets drafted in the fourth round and still comes out and plays? In fact, I had the Major League Scouts. They called me. They go, Coach, why did he play football? I said, because he loves to play. He loves to compete. We won the state champion. You know, he's yeah. he's tremendous at it. I thought that would be, like, yeah. a good thing. And, and I think some did look at that as, like, that's pretty impressive. But yeah. they're like, what about his father? Been, I mean, he, good yeah. family. Yeah. yeah. Right? No so. doubt. So, um yeah, so it's been fun, you know, from, uh, you know, Carl Jones and Matt Gonzalez was one of the leading receivers, the tight end type mm-hmm. receivers of, in 1AA. He went to Robert Morris, just graduated. Um, Cordell Hoover, uh, Division Two, And then, we, of course, we had, uh, you know, a bunch of guys in 17. And Quintel Kent was outstanding. And, and uh, Jalen Staple right? and Davidson. He, yeah, he had a heart issue, so he can't play anymore. Okay. He got medical, DQ'd. Okay. And, um, you know, and then the two guys this year. And, uh, and we've done it from guys like 6'4 and to, like, Five five, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it was just, uh, you know, the guys understand it. They understand the system. I think a lot of it has to do. We've had really smart quarterbacks that don't get enough credit because they're mostly one-year starters, mm-hmm. but they're, they're complete. Their rating and completion ratio and touchdown to interception ratio has been outstanding. We complete sometimes, you know, between the almost 70% of our passes, 60 to 70% in most years. And uh, a major touchdown interception ratio, you know, 20 something to single digits, you know, low single digits uh, on average. So uh, they're smart. They know where to get the football. They know when to take their shots. And a good running game helps a good passing game. You know, when you start loading the box up and then you got a guy like Foster, McKenzie, or these guys one on one out there, um, that's a conundrum to be in. You know, you want to cover and you're going to play, you're going to play with that's, six or that's, seven. That's in the a box, great word, coach. You know? It's not the word of the day, but <laughs> conundrum's up there. It's yeah. tough. I, I think. You know, you you yes. kind of you kind of touched on a lot of the aspects of why your offense and why the receivers are so successful, but I have to give a lot of credit to your offensive lines over the years. They have been fantastic. No doubt. Even last year, I mean, there was some, you know, Joey had a lot a lot of like what he he wouldn't get touched to the second or third level in yeah. in some of those cases. So yeah, your Dan, offensive line has been fantastic. Dan Scanlon has been there since my father in law is, and he's been the line coach forever. And he's the grad of St. Ed's, played at John Carroll. He's done a one, he's done a wonderful job with the guys, and uh, it, that that's what I'm saying. You know, when when the running game is that good, you, it makes the passing game so much easier. And, and some teams do it different ways. You know, Medina, we play. They're five wide receivers and throw it every time instead of the run through the pass. You know, we're still tr- old school, traditional that we're going to establish the running game. And we're going to pound out yards and get, you know, get our four and five and breaks on. And then when those safeties start creeping, you know, we have the threats of the guys that can run the post or the double moves over the top. And uh, if you got a smart quarterback that knows when to take a shot and knows how to throw those, and we practice that a lot, uh, it, you know, you, you could get explosive plays, you know, pretty quickly. You mentioned Coach Scanlon. He's also been a big part of your weight room effort, correct? 
Uh, you know, of, of late, maybe at one time, but um, okay. we have Augie Promersberger now and Jimmy Gudjevsky. You know, so we got a, a, a strength staff now that's been there for my five, okay. about five of the six years now, I think. And uh, they've done just, uh, you know, it, 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 it takes a, um, um, you know, it, what are they, what's the saying? It takes a, a village, a village, you know, and, and, and we certainly have that. I guess I'm the spokesman for it. But, you know, we have uh, 13 or 12 assistants on the varsity level and then another eight freshman coaches and a strength staff and a training staff and manager, managers, student managers. All of them are extremely important, plus the 130 players that are competing for not only amongst the team, but then trying to go play someone else. So it's a wonderful time to be coaching. You know, it's saying that football is important, no doubt, but it's within the scope of the school. You know, it's within the – we're trying to develop the young men in the Holy Cross tradition. And I went to Gilmore, uh, so that's a Holy Cross school. I believe in it. I believe in Catholic education. And I just think um, – you could learn a ton of things from it. Do you want to win the state title of the year? You sure as hell do. Am I, do I still wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning about the that game we're talking about? I still do. Thanks, Pat. And, uh, <laughs> you know. I didn't bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my point is, you know, that, that that's the goal of it. But in the end, uh, if the young men were developed, as any coach would say, if they're better for it, you're, you know, we've won some we probably shouldn't have, and we've, we've lost some maybe we shouldn't have. But, you know, in the end, uh, it, it's successful and um, – uh, in more ways than just wins and losses, you know, try and strive for excellence, uh, you know, not just success. I think. The, the Holy War obviously is, is a, a big to do around here, but what is it about not only yourselves in St. Ignatius, but Menor, the three of you schools have like stood toe to toe with each other over the last few years. And what is it about those pro you, you guys seem to bring out the best in each other? Yeah, that's why these, some of these games should be played. I mean, you know, you got to start with Coach Kyle. I mean, 11 state championships. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, it speaks for itself. I mean, if you're, you know, they have a ton of boys. Uh, you know, Saint, a lot of people know Saint Ignatius has about 500 more students than Saint Ed's, just regular. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they're going to get their their players. They get first of all, uh, they, we all get real good players. I mean, you can't do it without that. But then staffs, there's been continuity among staffs. You know. Coach Kyle's been there over, you know, almost 40 years or 38 years or whatever it's been. And, hey, the you know, judge said something positive. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you consider yourself lucky. Uh-oh. <laughs> judge John O'Donnell uh, oh, said something positive. Johnny, what's up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I thought he was forgetting to cut the meds in half the last couple of weeks, but he said you're a great coach, best in Ohio. So oh. that that's a huge compliment coming from a guy who hasn't had much positive to say, Coach. <laughs> so on that note, a lot of people may not know this. I think everybody here does. Um, back in your younger, in your early days, you coached basketball too. You yeah. were the football coach and the basketball coach at US. And then when you went to Lake, you just became you just went into football. Was there ever? A, a possibility or an option to coach basketball somewhere else too, or have basketball become your oh, it was. primary. It was my primary. You know, when I was that basketball coach, US, I was assistant football, and um, yeah, I wanted. To, in fact, Eric Flannery and I came down to the finalists, and Jim Kubaki, our president. Yeah, he for told, the us the story. told us the story. Yeah. Yes, we so, had him on uh, over the summer remotely. He yeah. told us the story, and uh, I still had a handwritten note from Jim, and he said, you know, you're two best young coaches, and but we're going to stick with one of our own, which made a lot of sense. You know, like, I mean, look at it now. I was like, you know, <laughs> this this know, just in, choice. he's been pretty good. Yeah. Yes. You know, but uh, uh, so, uh, in fact, speaking of Judge O'Donnell, when I was a high school student, Dave Bielak was the head coach at Gilmore, assistant basketball, and John played on the 1980. They, they, were, they were teammates at Lake Catholic. They were Catholic. teammates yeah. at Lake Catholic. So that whole team would come in and as the old guys, I guess, because they were about 10 years older, and we'd scrimmage all, uh, open gym all the time with the 19. 19- 80 Lake Catholic team. John was pretty good. <laughs> he was a solid player. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because I played CYO hoops when I was at Mount Carmel. We played at Lake, so you know we there was a little bit of a relationship built with those guys. And anyway, sure. it was it was a really good group of guys. They were talented. They didn't have quite enough to uh, knock off Clark and, and his crew. Right. But uh, yeah, Dave Udath was an outstanding player. Oh yeah. Played at Cleveland State. I've and, heard about the stall game a ton from uh, yes. all these yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. The, they they did everything they could to take the air out of the ball and, and give themselves the best chance to win. And unfortunately for them, it just wasn't quite enough. And I mean, Clark's group was that was an extremely talented group of guys. Yeah. So, Coach, you've you've talked a lot about tradition and what you guys are trying to do at St. Ed's and that kind of leads me to my coach's question which this year is why are you who you are oh that would take another uh, whole segment of the show you know it, it, we got a little time yeah, coach. Yeah, go but, ahead yeah, well you know it starts without your upbringing your family where the schools you went to and the people that influenced you 
and I was influenced by some great, great coaches, not only who I played for, speaking of Dave Belak, one of them, you know, uh, uh, my football coach, Dan Barron, God rest his soul, Mike Pose. I mean, I, uh, Ray Sharnsky was my baseball coach, he's a Hall of Fame baseball coach. Um, Another guy, God rest his soul. Yeah, right? no yeah. doubt. Uh, Put him on the calendar. Yeah, he's, um, so, you know, it started there. Then I got to, you know, coach with, and then Coach Guprod was my assistant, and I just learned a ton from him uh, about how to run a program. My father-in-law is John Gibbons. So I got to be around that, uh, you know, a ton, and you just keep going on. And I've become great friends with Larry Karras. I mean, these guys are Hall of Fame, uh, you know, guys and coaches. And you just, I just think I observed a lot when I was young. I had good mentors, and I just uh, uh, just saw and, and took just sank everything in uh, to try and uh, – not, not about X's and O's because, you know, that's a big part of it. And I love to do that still, and I, I still call the plays and – I, I, I wouldn't just coach if I couldn't do that. that. That's why I coach. I coach the quarterbacks. I call the offense. I mean, so I'm an assistant coach, too. I just happen to be the head coach at the same time. And uh, some guys do that differently, and, and, and but I love that aspect of the game. So I, And you don't have to do it like that, but that's a that's a big part of it. But more so, learning from those guys was just how to deal with a team, uh, how to motivate kids, uh, what's really important, you know, uh, in the game, and uh, the relationships and the loyalty of it all. And I think when kids see that that truth, you know, and they see that that's for real from you, I think you have a chance to to be successful as a coach. Beautiful. Greatly appreciate it. Well, Coach, we really appreciate you taking a few minutes to come down here. And uh, did you ride your bike? I didn't ride my bike. Oh, you know, it's funny. I came I'm up. I'm glad I didn't bet. I came up board and I, I actually turned the wrong way. I, I, I made a left. Uh, <laughs> I had to go towards Dino's. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. It's on the right. So well, I, you go to Dino's, Dino's not Dino's. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Was, Ain't nothing wrong with Dino's. No, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. But, but Coach, we, we greatly appreciate you taking some time out and, 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 and helping us work this out so logistically we could get it done. Greatly appreciate the relationship we have at St. Ed's. Kevin Hickman, Coach Flan, like you mentioned, um, have been great to us, and, and we really appreciate it. And I am going to wish you, like I've wished everybody else, I know it's not quite the right number, but I'm going off of the old model, 15 weeks of healthy. Yeah. That's the key. Well, we want to see you guys on that new turf at Lakewood. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah that, compared to what it's been. Yeah. Gosh, <laughs> but let me ask you one question, because that was one other question I wanted to ask. With the prospect of there not being any fans this year, I know you guys in the past historically have tried to play one game actually at school. Mm-hmm. Is that on the boards for this yeah, year potentially? Yeah, I, th- I think that could be. You know, it's, it's harder to space, though, like inside. Our school's kind of crunched, so we, we, we haven't true. decided. Lakewood, you could spread out a little bit more, especially okay. for there's no fans. And the turf is brand new, so... We'll, Why we'll not see. utilize we'll, it? Yeah, yeah. we're okay. not. I think we'll only have a couple of the home games, but I do. I do want to say you guys do such a great job for high school sports. Thank you for your time and efforts and what you do to promote it. And you know, it's it, it's really the, the the truest of the sports. I think, um, or the truest of the level of the sports. You know, these kids do it for the love of it. Some will advance on and play at many levels. Some won't at all. But everybody, you, you, it's funny. The the major college player, even the pros that come back, Alex Boone, but the guys that play Division One, you ask them. What do you remember most, they'll say, playing for St. Ed's? You know, their high school experience. I bet you ask any college player, they would say, tell I, you I, same I, thing, I, yes. I, you know, playing at Benedict and was that, that, and I think that says a lot right there mm-hmm. of, of where the kids are developed, you know. Thank you. Thank yes, you. thank coach, you. We thank really you so much. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, guys. Appreciate